Welcome everyone to another lecture in GI system which is about anatomy of large uh, intestine. Um, you remember from the last time uh, we uh, uh, talked about the small intestine and we said that this is the terminal end or the distal end of the ileum which is the end of a small intestine and at the same time it's the beginning of large intestine so this is the large intestine you see in this uh, figure that extends from the distal end of the ileum all the way to the uh, anus so it's about 1.5 meter you remember that the small intestine about six meters but the large intestine is shorter than the small intestine and it's about just 1.5 meters so why we call it then large intestine well indeed we call it large intestine because it's i mean the diameter the caliber uh, in large intestine uh, which is uh, greater than that uh, in a small intestine. So we call it large intestine because of the caliber, because of the diameter, not because of the length. Anyway, so again, this is the large intestine that's formed from, as you see here, the appendix, cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, which is like a shape, and rectum plus the anal canal so we, we have to know that the um, main function of the large intestine is to absorb the water and electrolytes and also at the same time to store the undigested material uh, to be expelled as uh, uh, feces so uh, uh, not just the caliper of the large intestine is the only feature that uh, uh, that we use to distinguish the large intestine. Indeed, we have uh, three features that uh, exclusively um, uh, found in the large intestine. What they are? Well, the first one is the tinea coli, and you have Hausdorff column and omental appendices. Let me show you each one for now, then we will talk about um, each uh, feature. So this is the what we call it tina coli, which is a muscular band. We have three of them. Each one has um, a different name. So this is the tina coli that, you know, exist in the whole large intestine except the appendix and uh, rectum. Also, look at the uh, another feature which is important in the large intestine. Look at it here. It's like a pouch. It's indeed like kangaroo's pouch. It's like kangaroo's pouch, which is like um, a distinction in the wall of the large intestine. We call them uh, each one hostrum, but all of these, like plural, we call it hostra of colon. This is really uh, 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 important feature there. Also, look at these fat um, uh, 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 bandages here. We call it omental uh, appendices. So you have three features. You have the tina coli, you have the hostra, and you have these kind of fat appendices. We call it omental appendices. Right? So let us start with the tina coli. So first of all, the tina coli is a is a, 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 a smooth muscle. It's a thickened band of smooth muscle that you see here. It started from the base of the appendix. That means there is no tina coli on the appendix, which is an important feature. That means if you pull the tina coli until the end, you will reach the pace of the appendix. And really, this is important feature to find the appendix because you pull the tina coli all the way to reach the pace of the appendix. That means 
when it terminates that means you reach man the pace of the appendix anyway again the tina coli is a thickened band of smooth muscle so say for example that the smooth muscles around the appendix it's totally encircled it but once it reached the pace of the appendix they divided into three bands they divided into three bands as you see in the figure below this is the appendix Catched by the uh, forceps and look at the muscles at the pace of the appendix they divided into three bands we call them tina uh, tina coli so uh, as i mentioned because at the pace of the appendix a thick and longitudinal uh, uh, layer of appendix and slid in three pans so the if you look at the tina coli you will see that they run the length of the of the large intestine among i mean the cecum ascending colon transverse colon hairs and the descending colon and also the sigmoid colon now after sigmoid colon you know you have the rectum so at this point at the recto sigmoid junction at the junction between the rectum and sigmoid now the these longitudinal pans of a smooth muscle again will unite it united again you see here they all united and form like outer coat of the rectum so see the the the, the uh, forming a longitudinal muscle layer around the um, rectum as you see so the tina coli we can say that it's not as a pants right it's not exist in the appendix and not exist in the rectum so r a so it's not exist in the rectum and appendix okay so as i mentioned we have a three pants so let us start with the from opposite here from the free tina coli look at the large intestine look anteriorly we open the um here is the cecum which is uh just to know that this is a window we are looking inside the um uh, cecum anyway look at it here look at this pan we call it free tina coli why it's free tina coli because there is no mesentery attached to it and there is no if you look at it here also it's continue free tina coli there is no um what we call it omental appendices attached so this is the omental appendices right these these are omental appendices so it's a free there is nothing attached to it like that omental appendices and there is no mesentery attached to it. so we call it free tina coli this is the first um, one okay so we finished this one now what about the omental tina coli from its name omental tina coli that means a pan in which omental appendices attached to it where is that this is the omental tina coli look at it here it's like look at the hook here so it's like retracted um to show you where is it here is the um, the what we call it omental tina coli look at the appendices attached to it also here is the omental look at the omental um, tina coli look at the omental appendices attached to it look like too much of obindal many of omental appendices attached to this so we call this one is the omental Tina coli. Okay, what about the, the we finished this? What about the last one, which is uh, we call it mesocolic tina coli from its name? That means this tina coli uh, or the mesocolon attached to this tina coli. And you know, this word mesocolic preserved to transverse colon and sigmoid meso, uh, sigmoid colon. Where is the, this? Is the transverse colon and this is the look at here like the yellow color this is the transverse mesocolon the double layer of peritoneum that connects the la the transverse colon to the posterior abdominal wall so look at this point here at this edge here this is a tina coli here we call it mesocolic tina coli okay we said that mesocolic tina coli in which 
like it's a uh, uh, to which the transverse and sigmoid mesocolon attached. So this is the transverse mesocolon as you see here attached to it. What about the sigmoid? Again, here is the sigmoid um, uh, colon and this is the sigmoid mesocolon that hangs the sigmoid mesocolon to the posterior abdominal wall as you see here. And here is attached to the mesocolic tina coli. Okay, here is like flipped also to show you where is that. It's in the back here. So this is a part of it. So also it's here all the way. So, and you know, at the rectosigmoid junction, the tina coli, you see? You see how is the uh, tina coli, for example, the free one, it's like a blended with a mesocolic uh, one with the omental one look, and they form the outer longitudinal layer of the uh, rectum, right? So that was the tina coli, the one of the important feature of large intestine. The second one, which is the hostra, you know, look at these pouch as I mentioned, which is like kangaroo's pouch. Uh, it's like pockets. Why these circulations? Why these hostra formed? Indeed, imagine you saw something uh, like uh, a piece of clothes, then you have. Um, a short string so when you sew it like this and it's short uh, when you pull it there then because the string that you have is short so the result you get like these circulation right because I mean here the tina coli the tina coli this muscular band is shorter than shorter than the large intestine and because of that it creates a kind of these circulation right and the la the last feature of large intestine which is the omental appendices what's the omental appendices look at the omental appendices there are many and this is a really very important feature in the large intestine indeed omental appendices are a kind of um uh, uh, um let us say uh, herniation or like uh, um, like extension from the peritoneum you know the large intestine like covered for example the ascending one covered anteriorly just by peritoneum but there is a pouch come out from the peritoneum and these pouches from the from the peritoneum filled with um, what we call it a fat so these pouches of peritoneum and our small sac that filled with fat we call it omental appendices so it's a small fatty like uh, projections okay so um, we will start with the different parts of large intestine starting from the cecum which is um, like a, 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 a blind uh, sac and this is the widest part of the large intestine this is the widest part of large intestine and completely intraperitoneal and you know you can it has a considerable amount of movement so the cecum is completely covered by peritoneum then jump up with the ascending colon that's a little bit narrower than the um, uh, cecum and it's retroperitoneal that means the peritoneum is just covered anteriorly by peritoneum that means it's located behind the peritoneum not like the cecum completely covered by peritoneum then we will go to the transverse colon then descending colon that's again similar to the ascending uh, colon it's retroperitoneal then to the sigmoid colon which is like s shape we'll talk about it and uh, of course, the transverse colon and sigmoid colon, they have their own mesentery. We call them transverse and sigmoid mesocolon. And it's a mobile. Um, it has, a, say, a freedom of movement, uh, especially in its middle part. Then we will shift to the uh, rectum and inner canal. But I think I will make like... Uh, a separate lecture for rectum and inner canal because there are too much details to talk about it so 
let us start with the cecum. This is the cecum. This is the most dilated uh, or widest part of the large intestine. This is the first part of large intestine. It's a cecum. Uh, it's uh, a blind ended pouch. Look at it here. This is the cecum in which it opens up to the ascending column, but inferiorly, no, it's like a sac, so it's not open inferiorly so that's why it's a blind end pouch or sac first of all where is located which is important it's located in the right iliac fossa this is the right iliac fossa this is the iliac uh, uh, iliac bone and this is the right iliac fossa where is the cecum located and completely covered by peritoneum look at it here and um, although it's completely covered by peritoneum and it's uh, a kind of fixed by cecal folds, as you see here, but still it has a considerable amount of mobility, um, uh, which is uh, uh, which is good. So this is a cadaver that you see here is the small intestine, and these are superior mesenteric vessels, and here's the right iliac fossa in which you see what we call it here is the cecum, which is the cecum. Look at the hostra of large intestine. Look at the uh, omental appendices. This is a transverse colon. Anyway, back to the cecum here in the right iliac uh, fossa. Let us open the, let us remove the anterior wall of cecum. Let us open it and see what's in there. First of all, when you look to the cecum, what's most interestingly here, because we mentioned that this is the terminal part or the distant end of the ilium that opens into the posterior medial uh, wall of the cecum. That means this is what we call it iliocecal valve. This is the iliocecal valve, but this valve indeed let, let us look at it here it's look it looks like a two folds of a mucus uh, membrane um these um mucus membrane or we call it ileocecal folds you have one superior and one inferior so these folds united laterally to form frenulum we call the frenulum of ileocecal valve. This is the frenulum, right? And this is the superior and inferior mucosal fold or superior and inferior um, ileocecal uh, fold, right? So, do you think it's really a valve? Well, indeed, it's not. It's just two horizontal folds of mucous membrane projects around the orifice of ilium where is that this is the ileal orifice if you open them you will see here this opening is the ileal orifice this is the ileal orifice right so these are just mucosal folds around it anyway we call it ileocecal valve but indeed they don't have really sphincteric action to prevent the return of food or contents from the cecum and ascending colon um, uh, uh, into the ileum. So, uh, because during the endoscopy of a living person, they found that they really, really they don't have the uh, or this valve has no sphincteric action in uh, uh, closing and uh, preventing the return of contents into the ileum but indeed that's during the endoscopy in living person right but indeed look at the terminal end of the ileum and you know in its wall you have a smooth muscle that ends in this papilla you see this ileal papilla this ileal papilla indeed uh, which is under the uh, uh, that indeed the ileal papilla is the uh, structure that uh, located on the cecal side of course uh, that serves as a relatively passive flap valve that is preventing the uh, reflex from the cecum into the ileum as contraction um, occur to propyl content that means when the uh, stuff there in the cecum uh, try to push up this will lead to like uh, 
contraction of this papilla and uh, preventing the return of the um, uh, content into the ileum. That means these folds is just a mucosal fold, and they found that the smooth muscle around the valve is like underdeveloped. That means there is no real anatomical valve. It just, as the physiologists call it, ileocecal sphincter. Because, yes, it serves as a sphincter here. I mean the ileal papilla or the smooth, or the circular muscle, sorry, uh, of the lower end of ileum. That means this is the ileum and the lower end of ileum, the circular muscle in the lower end of ileum, as physiologists, as the physiologists call it ileocecal sphincter, that serves as sphincter and it controls the um, flow of contents from the ileum into the colon. So now how is contract and relaxed, as physiologists said, that the smooth muscle tune is reflexly uh, increased when the cecum is distended, right? When there is like stuff there, so then contracted, uh, reflexly. So these smooth muscles reflexly increased uh, during the distension of the cecum. On the other hand, it's, you know, under the, uh, what we call it, a hormone called gastrin that's secreted, of course, produced by the um, stomach. This gastrin hormone indeed causes relaxation of muscle uh, tone. So by this way, it's contracted and relaxed. But the mucosal folds here has nothing to um, do uh, in the preventing of return of stuff from the cecum to the M. Anyway, so let us shift now to the uh, relation of the cecum. Relation of the cecum is very simple. You know that this is the cecum in which it's located again in the right iliac fossa. Excellent. So, what's anteriorly? Of course, uh, you have the anterior abdominal wall. This is the cecum. So, you have uh, anterior, the anterior abdominal wall. You have the greater omentum that you see here. We explain the greater omentum. We talked about it in the peritoneum lecture. And, of course, you have a kind of coils of small um, intestine. That's anteriorly. But, let us have look to the upper figure here and what's behind the cecum well there are a couple of structures important behind the cecum you have two muscles three nerves two vessels excellent so because you know this is the iliac fossa that means this muscle is the iliacus muscle right and its sister there are two muscles right the iliacus and its sister we we call it sous major muscles so sous major muscle and iliacus these two sisters they united here to form iliosous muscle right so it's a very well known symbol muscle that acts on the um, uh, bending uh, the trunk toward the um, thigh or and vice versa of course during the album from your bit anyway so you have the iliacus and you have the sous major and you know that there is a nerve passes along this or traverses the iliacus muscle. What's this nerve? It's the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh. So this is the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh that passes just on the iliacus. But there is another muscle passes on the sous also, which is the genitofemoral nerve. Of course, this is a branch from the lumbar plexus. Anyway, so that means you have a nerve on the iliacus and you have a nerve on genitive femoral nerve. Just extra information here that you know this nerve, the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, this nerve passes in really tight, passes from uh, a tight location, which is between the anterior superior iliac spine and the inguinal ligament here. So this tight location, uh, especially those uh, carrying heavy uh, stuff on their flank and those wearing like tight uh, pelts. So this create a pressure on it leads to a numbness on the uh, anterior um, uh, uh, side of the uh, uh, thigh, right? So we explain that um, in a video. Uh, in a separate uh, video, you can watch it as well. So anyway, just try to make sure that you remember. So this is the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, and this is the genitofemoral 
uh, near that passes through the inguinal canal on the way to the distance. Okay, special genital branch, I mean. The femoral branch, no. Outside to the upper right of the upper side of the uh, thigh. Okay, that means nerve on the iliacus, nerve on the south major, and there is a nerve between these two muscles, not just on them, no, between them, which is very known nerve. We call it femoral nerve. So you know that the femoral nerve passes between the two sisters, between iliacus muscle and psoas major muscle. Okay, so you have psoas, iliacus, you have lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh, femoral nerve, genital femoral nerve, excellent. But also you have two with one large and one small. So you have the external iliac artery and you have the gonadal vessels, right? Conadal vessels. Okay, the right one, right? Because you have just one cecum, right? That's on the right. Excellent. Okay, so what about the blood supply of the cecum? Well, that's very simple. If you remember the superior mesenteric artery that gives a very important branch, which is the iliocolic artery that has colic branch and iliac branch that why called iliocolic artery which is a branch of superior mesenteric artery okay now it has of course uh, it gives like let us say two branches the anterior cecal and posterior cecal arteries that uh, sub that they of course supply the um uh, cecum and the veins regarding veins uh, the same it drains into superior superior mesenteric uh, vein and lymphatic drainage as I always say the lymphatic drainage follow the deep arches so they will drain from different lymph several uh, mesenteric nodes finally to uh, reach the lymph nodes around the superior mesenteric artery, we call it the superior mesenteric lymph node. Follow the arteries, right? So this is another view. Show you the superior mesenteric artery and the iliocolic artery that gives, of course, here is better to see the anterior cecal artery and the posterior cecal artery. Let us start with the appendix. Um, you have an idea about the uh, cecum, of course, and you know from the cecum, or let us say the cecum has two openings, one for the um, distal end of the ilium and uh, at the iliocecal junction uh, that opened, as I mentioned in the posterior medial wall that you cannot see here that's from the back now just about two centimeters uh, posterior to the opening of the ilium in the cecum there is another opening uh, which is um, for the appendix so yes this is the appendix which is also open in the posterior medial wall of the uh, cecum what's the appendix Indeed, the appendix is a narrow muscular tube uh, that has, uh, look at it here, it's connected uh, by a small triangular mesentery that we call it meso appendix. Not mesocolon, not transverse mesocolon, not uh, uh, sigmoid mesocolon. It has a, a, a mesentery that specialized to it and its name, like preserved to it, it's meso appendix so this triangular small mesentery is the meso appendix look at the free border of this mesentery this is the free border of the meso appendix and if you look here you will see that there is an what we call it appendicular vessels passes at the free border of the meso appendix which is very important so this is the first thing that means the appendix is not just suspended by a mesentery called meso appendix and it's a free border there is an what we call it appendicular vessels pass to it but also it's completely covered by um, peritoneum 
and because uh, it's uh, you know it opens in the cecum that you expect that it's located in the right iliac uh, fossa so as i mentioned um, um arises from posterior mirror aspect of the cecum just two centimeters below the ileocecal uh, uh, junction and you know it's about eight or seven to ten centimeters you know it's a uh, variable from uh, from one to another and indeed histologically it contains a numerous lymphoid tissue in its um, uh, wall so uh, you know that it has uh, no tina coli and it has no omental appendices and also you know that in the large intestine the appendix and the rectum uh, have no tina coli right this is number one and also appendix cecum and uh, rectum we call it car right cecum appendix and rectum they don't have omental appendices they don't have these peritoneal pouch that's filled with fat right okay so yes this is the appendix and what's important uh, about the uh, location of the appendix i would like to say let me erase it uh, that during surgery sometime i will show you where is really the uh, different position of the appendix the appendix has a couple of positions but sometime it's hidden behind the cecum and ascending column or behind the ileum so surgeons usually follow the tina coli of the ascending colon and cecum all the way until it ends when the tina coli ends we know that it is now here is the pace of the appendix that means as i mentioned earlier at the beginning of the video that the tina coli ends at the pace of the appendix that means they the surgeons follow the tina coli until very until it ends once ends they know yes we found the pace of the appendix so where is the base of the appendix why we care about the pace of the appendix but not the um apex of the appendix itself because the apex of the the apex of the appendix can be variable can be like behind the cecum behind the ascending colon um hang down in the pelvis or behind the idiom or anterior to idiom or whatever so there are a couple of positions we'll talk about them but but the pace of the appendix is the fixed part that we are care about so you remember uh, from previous lectures that this is the iliac bone and anteriorly there is a process very important a process we talk too much about it which is the anterior superior iliac spine anterior superior iliac spine very important easy landmark to find and you know the umbilicus here so if you draw a line between these two landmarks and if you take the point that's located one third of the way um, along the oblique line uh, that joining anterior superior spine and umbilicus you will find the location of the umbil uh, the base of appendix that means this is the oblique line divided into three parts okay so this is the medial third this is the middle third and let us say this is the medial if it's correct to say the medial Two third, and this is the lateral one third. So the point of meeting between the lateral one third and the medial two third here is the McBurney point. This is very important to know in the exams and in the surgeries and in the clinical. Why? Why is clinical is important because surgeons open incision there at this location and also it is the location of the pace of the appendix that means if during the uh, rebound test or during the uh, let us say the physical examination of the appendix if you suggest uh, we expect you have um, a patient uh, with uh, uh, appendicitis so 
you go to this McBurney point and create a kind of uh, a little bit of pressure or something called rebound test. You make a pressure, then you remove your hands suddenly. Then, because the brittle peritoneum here is irritated, that means create a severe pain in the right iliac fossa. So this is the point of the maximum pain during the appendicitis. I mean the inflammation of the appendix. So this point is the McBurney point, which is um, that indicates the pace of the appendix again and again i'm saying base not the apex okay so let us um have a look about or an idea about the most common positions of the appendix and um you know maybe that the most common one which is the retrocecal or we call it sometimes retrocolic so this is the line showed that the um, appendix or the um, apex of the appendix behind the cecum, we call it retrocecal or retrocolic because it's behind the cecum and or behind the ascending column. This one, which is common about 65%, is really common here. Retrocecal or retrocolic. And the second most common position is the pelvic. We call it a uh, pelvic appendix it just um, hangs down into the uh, pelvis it's about let us say 30% um, or 32% this one right this is the pelvic so you have to know that the first two I mean the retrocecal or retrocolic and the pelvic um, appendix um, these are the most common position or most common sides of the appendix. So if you don't find the appendix, he is most commonly behind the cecum. It's hidden behind the cecum. So you have retrocecal, retrocolic, or sometimes just hang down into the pelvis. Uh, other position was like rare can be subsecal. Um, that means below the cecum and it's about two percent here here you can see the percent right sometimes it's um, behind the ilium uh, we call it post ilial and like this like this one or anterior to ilium we call it pre ilial so it can be pre ilial or post ilial but just uh, low percentage yes so you have to know where is the most common position which is important so you see in this figure my friends that now uh, somebody with acute appendicitis that like look to the appendix which is uh, uh, really inflamed and in this case in the I mean the acute appendicitis it's a um, common inflammation of the appendix uh, caused sometimes by bacteria sometime because of obstruction of the lumen um, of the appendix for a reason or another can be sometimes obstructed by feces during if somebody has a constipation or so sometimes inflamed and the lumen closed and so forth in this case the inflamed the inflamed um, abind, um, uh, appendix can uh, sometime uh, obstruct the blood supply and also the inflammation can obstruct the blood supply can lead to gangrenous gangrenous appendicitis, right, which is really um, a severe um, danger case, right? So, first of all, uh, we mentioned it can be inflamed, swelling, and the lumen obstructed. So, when the lumen obstructed, that means the secretion of the appendix can be uh, uh, like restricted inside it. That means swelling more and more, and you know it's covered by visceral peritoneum that means the visceral peritoneum will be like stretched and there will be like severe pain and you know maybe that the appendix look at it here so the uh, uh, appendix which is located here right uh, it is innervated the sympathetic fibers that um, uh, sympathetic fibers that innervate the appendix also innervate the umbilicus, and because the pain from appendix um, ascends into the same 
uh, spinal cord segments, or let us say the thin thoracic segments, segments. So the pain at first from the appendix felt around the umbilicus. That's why we feel some, you know, or those come up with acute appendicitis. They feel at the first the pain felt around the umbilicus. Then it shifted to the right iliac fossa. Why? Because as I mentioned, the you know this area indeed innervated um uh, or uh, yes innervated by uh, number 9 chin 11 uh, uh, sympathetic fibers i mean from spinal uh, segments number 9 chin and 11 and the pain from that area ascends in these spinal segments and number 10 also extends to the appendix right and that's why the visceral once it's inflamed swelling the visceral peritoneum stretch you get pain in the visceral peritoneum then uh, it carried the pain carried by thoracic um, uh, segment uh, by the nerve to the thoracic segment in the spinal cord number 10 and it also the uh, thin thoracic segment receives also sensation from umbilicus so then the body cannot discriminate the pain that it comes from the appendix or from the uh, umbilicus so you feel the pain around the umbilicus then once the visceral peritoneum inflamed it irritates the parietal peritoneum above it here which is that lines the anterior abdominal wall that means the parietal peritoneum that lines the abdominal wall also irritated and there is a pain there so when you do a rebound test or you make like a little bit of pressure on the right iliac fossa you guilt the pain there that means the pain shifted from umbilicus to the right iliac fossa because the parietal peritoneum above it now it's irritated and the pain can be felt at the right iliac uh, fossa okay so we mentioned that this is the meso appendix um, with a mesentery of the appendix and in its free border you have a blood vessel appendicular artery which is a branch of if you follow it here to the pack okay so this is the appendicular uh, artery right which is a branch of iliocolic artery this one right it is a branch of superior mesenteric artery that means you expect the venous drainage also back to the superior mesenteric vein ilio of course iliocolic vein and superior mesenteric uh, vein and also the lymphatic drainage similar to the cecum to the lymph nodes around the superior mesenteric artery we call them superior mesenteric lymph uh, Note. So lastly, uh, as we talked about the uh, appendix connected to the cecum and mesoappendix, it's good to show you these um, folds. Look at these folds. You have around three folds fixing the cecum. So um, all of them except one, they have blood vessels uh, in um, those folds. So look at it here laterally. You have the cecal folds. We call them cecal folds. Also here, medially, you have this fold. We call it vascular fold of cecum. So this is the vascular fold of cecum that contains the anterior, the and the that contains the anterior cecal artery. You know the cecum supplied by anterior cecal artery and posterior cecal artery. So this vascular fold we call it vascular fold of cecum why vascular fold because there is a bloodless fold that means a fold here which is between the ileum and cecum we call it ilio cecal fold or we call it bloodless fold of trifs which is this fold mostly doesn't has blood vessels but listen, sometime it does. Sometime, um, uh, uh, often it has. Yes, 
you can find the blood vessels uh, blood vessels in it so yes these are all these folds i would like i would like to pay attention cecal folds here vascular fold that contains the um uh the uh, let us say the uh, arterial cecal artery and you have bloodless fold which is uh, we call it ilio cecal fold that has no blood vessels mainly uh, so and lastly you have one recess below the the vascular fold and one recess below this bloodless fold of treves right this is the superior and this is the inferior ilio cecal uh, recess this is a recess right okay now what about the uh, uh, ascending colon yes uh, we already explained the cecum and let us ascend up through the large intestine through the colon so you approach now the ascending colon so first of all it's located in the if you divide the uh, abdomen into uh, four parts you will see that it's located in the right lower quadrant this is number one and you know it's retroperitoneal structure what does it mean it means it's uh, it lies behind the peritoneum that means the peritoneum just covers as you see here in this figure uh, it covers just the anterior and the lateral side of the ascending column and similarly the descending column back to the ascending column look at the ascending column look at the peritoneum that covers the lateral and just anterior surface of the ascending column that means no peritoneum behind it that means it's retro peritoneal um, uh, structure so this is just to show you that uh, it's located in the mainly in the right iliac uh, in the uh, right lower quadrant and here is like if you divide it into uh, nine regions it's in the right um, the flank anyway what's the relation of the ascending column just keep in mind um, that it's a mirror of the uh, or the descending column it's a mirror of the relation of the descending column it's a mirror of ascending and sinking. but anyway back to the ascending column and the, the, post the anterior and posterior relation of it anteriorly you know this is again the ascending uh, column so anteriorly it's related to anterior abdominal wall and you see here is the greater omentum that you know descends like apron and of course coils of a small intestine that's very simple also similarly these structures also related to the um, descending colon back to the ascending uh, again this is the ascending colon that you see here posteriorly if you start from here it's related partially uh, to the um, iliacus muscle to the iliac crest to the um, uh, quadratus lamborum this is a muscle quadrangular in shape we call the quadratus um, lamborum and you have you see the shadow of the right kidney so it's related to the lower pool of the um, right kidney plus two nerves ilio which is a branch from lamar plexus ilio hypogastric and ilio inguinal uh, nerves so these structures related to the posteriorly to the ascending um, uh, colon so what's the blood supply of the ascending colon this is the ascending colon you remember that maybe that the ascending colon is part it originates or developed from the uh, mid gut that means it's applied from branch from superior mesenteric artery which branch this is the superior mesenteric artery that gives if you remember the iliocolic branch and also it gives the right colic branch now forget the middle one it's not the time to talk about the middle colic just you have iliocolic and you have right colic iliocolic and right colic those branch branch supply the ascending colon and similarly the venous drainage will be um, to the uh, veins corresponding to those artery ultimately again to the superior mesenteric vein very simple so iliocolic and right colic lymphatic drainage as i am saying always that the lymphatic vessels uh, follow the deep arteries that means there are uh, lymphatic vessels drain the two uh, lymphatic nodes lying along the uh, 
um, colic arteries and yeah, I mean the idiocolic and right colic so there are lymph nodes there uh, ultimately they will drain again to the source close to the lymph nodes that close to the source of the arterial supply which is you know that this is the superior mesenteric artery and here is you have the lymph nodes around the superior mesenteric artery we call them superior mesenteric node very simple to remember nerve uh, supply comes from the nerve plexus the sympathetic nerve plexus uh, superior around the superior mesenteric we call superior mesenteric um, the plexus and the parasympathetic of course comes from the vagus nerves okay i will skip now the transverse colon because um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's better to study directly the uh, descending colon because it's a mirror of the cecum and ascending so this is the um, the shadow you see here of descending colon be the descending colon as I mentioned it's equal to the uh, cecum and ascending colon so the descending colon is longer than the ascending colon because again it's equal to the cecum and ascending and also the relation of the descending colon it's uh, similar to the relation of the cecum plus the ascending column because it's equal to both anyway that means because it's longer it's located not just in the uh, um, left uh, lower quadrant no but also it's located in the uh, upper uh, left uh, lower quadrant that means it's on the left side in the upper and lower quadrants so it extends from the um, what we call it left colic flexure here there is a flexure we'll talk about it there is right colic flexure and there is left colic flexure so the descending column descends from the left colic flexure all the way until you reach the pelvic prim here is the entrance of from the false pelvis to true um, pelvis similarly as i mentioned it's a retroperitoneal structure that means it just cover from anterior and lateral that means the peritoneum covers the um, uh, lateral and anterior surface of this uh, part of the colon okay now again as I mentioned earlier the relation of the descending colon would be similar to the relation of the cecum a plus ascending colon so this is the descending colon my friends that means anteriorly which is similar to the um, ascending it's related of course to anterior abdominal wall and greater omentum and coils of intestine which is similar to uh, ascending back to descending as I mentioned uh, the posterior relation would be the similar to the cecum and ascending so it would be the adiacus and the left psoas uh, muscle quadratus lamborum um, iliac crest and uh, you see here the um, also idiohypogastric and idioinguinal nerve and also back here inferiorly you remember the cecum that's uh, related to the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh and femoral nerve yes also the back again yes we mentioned that's related to iliacus and psoas and also the lateral of course this is the left uh, lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh and the left femoral uh, nerve similarly if you know the structures that related to cecum and ascending you know the structures related to descending okay so let us summarize the uh, structures uh, let me change the color uh, summarize the structure related to the descending colon so you have iliacus pass on it the lateral cutaneous nerve of thigh you have the iliopsoas uh, you have the psoas uh, major of course the left one so you know uh, we have the iliopsoas uh, tendon here anyway between these two muscles you have the uh, femoral nerve you have the iliac crest quadratus lamborum you have the uh, iliohypogastric nerve ilioinguinal nerve and you have here the lower pool of the 
left kidney here as you see the left kidney so these structures related of course to the um, descending uh, colon the blood supply if you remember the ascending the blood supply to the ascending was from the idiocolic and right colic they are a branch um, from the superior mesenteric artery but the descending colon the descending colon my friends the blood supply comes because the descending colon is part from or it developed from the hind gut that means the blood supply is from inferior mesenteric artery not superior from inferior this is the superior and this is the inferior mesenteric artery that gives uh, a branch one of them is the not right colic no it's left colic artery that you know gives like many branch to the uh and supply the descending colon of course uh, it makes like here uh, anastomosis as a marginal artery with the middle uh, colic anyway so the blood supply of descending because descending colon part from hind gut that means the blood supply from inferior mesenteric artery through a left colic uh, artery and part from sigmoid branch because this is the um, uh, uh, left colic and sigmoid uh, branch so the sigmoid branch also participates in the supply of the descending uh, colon ultimately they are from the inferior mesenteric artery so uh, back to the now the transverse colon so because it's better to study the uh, let me change the color the study the uh, ascending colon sigma ascending colon then shift to the uh, descending uh, colon and cover the blood supply of both of them and uh, so the ascending as i mentioned ascending colon the blood supply comes from iliocolic and right colic while from superior mesenteric while the descending colon um the blood supply comes from the uh, inferior mesenteric through the left colic and sigmoidal anyway now let us shift to the transverse colon this is the transverse colon which is like hooked up or like pulled um, or reflected up anyway you have to know that the transverse colon is the longest part of the colon which is about 50 centimeters and it's the more or the most mobile part of large intestine that usually occupied the umbilical region so the longest and the most mobile part of large intestine and you see here it's because it's why it's mobile because it's connected because it has its own mesentery that connected it to the posterior abdominal wall what's the name of the mesentery of transverse colon we call it transverse mesocolon right transverse mesocolon um, so this is a sagittal section you can see here is the stomach and here is the transverse colon and you see the transverse colon it's intraperitoneal structure and fixed to the posterior abdominal wall by a mesentery called transverse mesocolon look at it here like spread it up and below the pancreas so it originates from let us say or the root of transverse mesocolon ultimately lies along the inferior border of the pancreas this is the pancreas and the inferior border of the pancreas so it comes ultimately uh, from uh, here okay that's excellent so back again this is the transverse um this is the transverse column and it crosses look from the right corner to the left corner that means it has two corners this one which is again in the right we call it right colic flexure this is the right colic flexure this angle and this is the left colic flexure the right colic flexure is lower than the left the lift is more acute like sharp it's the angle is sharp than the compared to the right so the right colic flexure we call it hepatic flexure because it's against the liver right while the lift colic flexure called splenic so if you have the liver here you have spleen here because it creates a kind of 
embroaching on the um, uh, on the uh, hilum of the um, uh, what do we call it the uh, spleen. So this is the splenic flexure. Sometimes, usually, they prefer to use hepatic flexure and splenic flexure. Anyway, so the right. Let me erase it. Okay, so back again. The right colic flexure or the hepatic flexure lies against the ninth and tenth ribs, uh, which is like overlapped, as I mentioned, by the inferior part of the uh, liver. While the left colic flexure, we call it again the splenic flexure, is usually at the first. It's uh, if you draw it like this, it's higher than the. Um, right, uh, one more acute and less mobile because it's fixed. So you see the spleen. So it's fixed to the spleen. It's fixed to the to the pancreas, and it's fixed here. Most importantly, to the diaphragm. You know, here we have the diaphragm. Right, there is important ligament here. Um, uh, we will we we call it phrenico colic. Ligament that means phrenico that means that they are related to the diaphragm. This one, the ligament that we call it phrenico colic ligament, I will show you where is that again. This is the right colic flexure, left colic uh, flexure that's connected um, uh, posteriorly. You see here and to the spleen here and to the to the spleen here and to the diaphragm that's located here and uh, look at this the phrenico colic ligament this is the again left colic flexure related to the uh, hilum of the uh, spleen and also if you have the diaphragm here it's connected by this um, ligament phrenico uh, colic ligament that's why in the splenomegaly, when the spleen like enlarged for a reason or another in size, so because of the presence of this ligament, the phrenico colic ligament, then you find the inferior pole of the spleen like moved down there in that direction because this um, phrenico colic ligament prevents it from protruding in this uh, anteriorly. And in this direction, right? So it moved, the inferior pool moved in that direction, right? Okay. So the relation of transverse cones is very simple the anterior abdominal wall and the greater uh, omentum. And posteriorly, let us uh, look at it here. This is the right colic flexure, and this is the left colic flexure, and this is the transverse column. We cut it here to show what's going on behind it. So you have the second part of the duodenum. And of course, you have the head of pancreas, and sometimes that they are part from the third part, and you have the uh, coils of small uh, intestinal genome and um, ileum. So, um, what I want to say that uh, because of the posterior relation, it's variable. Why it's variable? Because sometimes, because you know, it's a freely mobile, that means the transverse column is variable in position right usually hanging to the level of um umbilicus l3 l4 and in thin and tall people the transverse colon um, may extend down to the pelvis right that's why uh the uh, posterior relation is like variable okay now to the blood uh supply and again, I like always to remind you with the blood supply of ascending and descending before jumping to the transverse. You know, this is the superior mesenteric artery, and this is the inferior. You know, superior mesenteric artery gives the iliocolic and right colic. Those supply the ascending colon and cecum. And here is the inferior mesenteric that gives the, not right colic, no, it gives left colic and uh, sigmoid arteries they uh, supply the descending colon now jump now to the transverse colon and maybe from embryology you know that the proximal two-third of the transverse colon comes from or develop from the mid gut while the distal one-third of transverse colon developed from 
hind gut that means the blood supply of mid gut as you know comes from superior mesenteric while the blood supply to the hind gut or the structure developed from hind gut comes from inferior mesenteric not superior mesenteric comes from inferior mesenteric that means the proximal two-third of transverse colon or the right two-third comes the blood supply uh, comes from the superior mesenteric artery exactly from the middle colic artery middle colic artery that of course anastomosis with the right colic here at the marginal forming margin artery anyway middle colic remember middle the transverse column in the middle that means middle colic artery right also what about the uh let the uh, left one third or the distal one third of transverse colon yes because it parts from the high and develop from behind gut that means it's a blood supply from inferior mesenteric exactly here from the lift you remember the um lift colic that gives the branch to the uh, uh, to the descending and also it also supplies the um the distal one third of transverse colon right okay and also here's a marginal artery between uh, those at the corners right so the veins correspond to the arteries and drain into you know arteries um, or the parts supplied by inferior mesenteric that means the blood supply will be back to inferior mesenteric vein bars from transverse colon that's supplied by superior mesenteric branch uh, so superior mesenteric artery or the branch of the superior mesenteric that means the blood supply will be drained into inferior into similarly superior mesenteric vein superior superior inferior with inferior and also as i am say it again and again the lymphatic drainage follow the deep arteries that means uh the proximal two-third of transverse colon uh will be drained into these you see these lymph nodes that follow the branch of superior um uh to the branch of superior mesenteric which is here in this case this is the middle colic artery right and these lymph nodes we call them middle colic lymph nodes and they of course drain into this is the superior mesenteric artery these nodes around superior mesenteric artery we call them superior mesenteric nodes and what about the distal one third similarly similarly you have um also and the distal one third these nodes drain along the that they exist along the left colic they ultimately drain into lymph nodes around the inferior mesenteric artery and these nodes called inferior mesenteric notes very simple follow the arteries lymphatic drainage for deep arteries okay that uh, was about the uh, ascending descending and transverse uh, colon now uh, we finished the uh, ascending colon transverse colon descending colon now it's the time to join the sigmoid colon look at this curved s shape part of the colon that uh, that's known as sigmoid colon sigmoid colon is a similar to transverse colon that it has its own uh, mesentery uh, while the mesentery of transverse colon was transverse mesocolon these the uh, uh, mesentery of the sigmoid colon called sigmoid mesocolon so that means it's a mobile structure similar to the transverse colon that means it's a, it's an i would say intraperitoneal structure so this is the final segment of the colon and it just look at it above the pelvic inlet and it extends from the beginning of the say of the pelvic inlet up to the uh, 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 as we call it S3, the vertebra of uh, or sacral vertebra uh, number uh, three, sacral vertebra uh, number uh, three. So this is the end of sigmoid colon and the beginning of the rectum, and this is the we call it recto sigmoid junction. That means extended from the pelvic inlet to the S3 vertebra, sacral vertebra number three. So it's a quite mobile, as in shape, except of course because here is started. Uh, 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 it's a continuation of the descending colon, and that mean, and you know the descending colon is retroperitoneal structure. That means it's fixed. Uh, 
that means this part of sigmoid cone is not that much um, it doesn't has that much of mobility similarly it's fixed to the rectum here so this part is not that much um, mobile so just the mainly the middle part is the uh, quite mobile um, but so that was about the uh, just uh, 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 we, we described just the uh, sigmoid location start and end and uh, its relation to peritoneum now if we want to dig deep and see what's behind uh, and lateral to the sigmoid indeed most importantly here the posterior relation of the um, uh, sigmoid you can see you have here is the lift common iliac artery that divided into internal iliac and external iliac look at the in the lift internal and external iliac branch they are located behind it that means what's behind the sigmoid the branch of the common iliac that means you have the internal and um, external iliac arteries of course i'm talking about the lift side right because the, the sigmoid on the left side what else if you know that the common iliac divided into internal and external you know this bifurcation um, uh, side that means you know that the ureter which is very important crosses anterior to this bifurcation that means what's behind the sigmoid also you have the ureter okay and also you know that the ureter is crossed by gonadal um, vessels that means also you have gonadal vessels and also you have the piriformis muscle here and you have the sacral plexus as well so what's posterior to the sigmoid the internal iliac external the left internal iliac and external iliac at the bifurcation here you have also the ureter crossed also by the gonadal vessels and you have the uh, uh, psoas muscle and sacral parts from the sacral uh, plexus indeed the obturator nerve because um, of course, the sigmoid cone has uh, 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 this part, I would say, has two parts. This is descending part and horizontal um, uh, horizontal part, descending part. So, the uh, laterally, it's related to the uh, left external iliac artery, obturator nerve here. And uh, in female, you have the ovary, and in the male, you have the vast difference and the lateral pelvic uh, wall as well, right? But anteriorly, again, this is the sigmoid, and anteriorly in the male, you have the urinary bladder. But in female, you know, the female has also uterus located here. So in male, uh, it's related to the posterior surface just of the urinary, urinary bladder, but in female, it's related to the posterior surface of the uterus, right? Okay, so that uh, uh, was the relation of sigmoid, but you we mentioned that the sigmoid is connected to the posterior abdominal ball by a mesentery. We call it the sigmoid mesocolon. So you know that sigmoid mesocolon comes from the posterior abdominal wall, so it has a root. This is the root of it. It's like V, inverted V shape. You know that this is V shape, but indeed the sigmoid mesocolon is inverted V shape that it has apex here and it has right limb and um, uh, left limb this is the right side huh? this is the left side anyway so it, we talked about the sigmoid the mesentery or the root of the sigmoid meso uh, colon let us erase these things the and again you can see here is again the inverted v shape of the sigmoid meso colon so the apex where is located look at the shadow here this is the um, external uh, iliac artery, left external iliac artery. That means here is the internal one. This is the external I iliac. This is the internal iliac. This is the perforation. This is the this. That means this is the common iliac that divided into internal and external iliac. This is the perforation. That means the apex of the V, the apex of the uh, sigmoid mesocolon, located near the um, the uh, bifurcation or division of of left common iliac into internal and external at this bifurcation, right? In which also look at the shadow here. You have the shadow of the ureter that crosses also here. So at again, 
the apex of the V located near the bifurcation of left common iliac artery inter internal and external that crossed by uh, ureter as I mentioned. Let us erase it again and let me show you here maybe the next figure. Here is the um, uh, the apex. This is the sigmoid meso column and this is the apex of it this is the right limb this is the left limb so this is the left common iliac artery that divided into external and internal and that this bifurcation of the common iliac crossed by the left ureter so this is the location of the apex so because you have to know uh, where is uh, what's going on in each uh, part of the mesentery. Now, what about the uh, left limb? This left limb that goes in this direction, close to the um, uh, let us say uh, medial border of the psoas major uh, muscle, right? And what about the right limb? The right limb indeed continues until the end of sigmoid. That means until the level of you know, S3, sacral vertebra number um, 3. Now, you have to know, look at the sigmoid arteries, which is a branch from inferior mesentic. These sigmoid arteries passes through this double layer of peritoneum, through this mesocolon, sigmoid mesocolon. So you have the uh, sigmoid arteries, and also you see this branch, which is the superior rectal vessel to the rectum. Superior rectal uh, vessels passes here in the border, left border here, in the, in the right, sorry, in the right um, limb here. Also, you have nerves and lymphatics, as you know. Here is again, this is the sigmoid um, mesocolon, uh, uh, in which the, um, it's like, um, this shape, right, in which the apex near the perforation of the common iliac and crossed by ureter. And uh, here is the look at the superior rectal artery that passes here. Let me raise it. Okay. So the superior rectal artery, the superior rectal artery passes in this right limb here, right, inside this peritoneum, inside the sigmoid mesocolon. Um, and here is the sigmoid arteries also, and lymphatics and nerves. Okay, so you know, as I mentioned, the blood supply will be through the sigmoid arteries branch from the um, inferior mesenteric uh, artery. Uh, just um, give you a quick uh, review about the venous drainage. Uh, so, um, you, we, we, we said that the venous drainage of the uh, um, spleen and here is, say, um, the pancreas and the abdominal part of gastrointestinal tract. That means I'm not talking about the uh, inferior part of rectum. No, just the abdominal part of GI, um, of course. Uh, all of these um, structures will be drained into the portal system of the vein. You have the portal vein here that drains the blood into liver to be toxified and metabolized then from the liver to the inferior vena cava, right? However, that means the blood from spleen, pancreas, GI tract, from the, say, the uh, stomach, duodenum, small intestine, genome, ileum, and uh, on large um, intestine until you reach the uh, lower part of the um, uh, rectum. So you have to stop here. So the abdominal part, because this is a pelvic part, the abdominal part of the, of the GI um, the tract would be drained into the portal vein. This is the portal um, vein. We call it the portal system of the vein that delivers the blood to the uh, liver. Now, it's good to know that the portal vein, how it's formed mainly, it's the final pathway of the blood from the GI structures, spleen, bacteria, called bladder, abdominal part of gastrointestinal tract, and it's formed by what? You have to know it's formed by S and S, not to forget, by splenic vein and the united with 
superior mesenteric vein S with S to remember right so splenic vein united with the superior mesenteric vein behind the neck of the pancreas which is very important this is the pancreas this is the head of pancreas neck of pancreas body and tail anyway so this is the neck of the pancreas behind it the portal vein formed by union of splenic vein and superior mesenteric um, vein somebody can say what about the inferior mesenteric vein the inferior mesenteric vein just drained into the splenic vein just it drains into it drains into splenic vein but the portal vein formed by the union of splenic with superior mesenteric s and s so again this is the portal vein and you know the tributaries mainly measure the uh, in general uh, that you have the right castic drains directly and right castic that drain directly into portal uh, vein that drain of course the lesser curvature of the stomach and you know uh, the uh, you have also cystic uh, vein here from the uh, gallbladder and what comes also to the portal vein directly is something called para umbilical vein here is the um, uh, uh, location where the uh, para-umbilical vein, if you have, say, the umbilicus here, so there is uh, a small veins that drain the blood from the diaphragm and anterior abdominal wall, kind of, and, and these, these veins, like, passes with the round ligament of the liver in between the two layers of falciform ligament until they pass here to the portal system and liver and drain um, there. So, this is the, we call it para umbilical um, uh, veins, and you have also the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic uh, superior mesenteric vein drains the blood as I mentioned uh, here. Let us erase it. So uh, this is the superior mesenteric vein that drains the blood from uh, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and uh, cecum ascending colon and the proximal right proximal two-thirds of transverse colon while the inferior mesenteric vein drains the blood from the splenic flexure and descending colon and sigmoid colon and the um uh, the uh, uh from part from the uh, uh rectum so this is the inferior mesenteric uh, vein that drains into splenic um, uh, vein caput medusa it's a word uh, you know um, comes from Greek mythology it's like uh, a snakes uh, at the it looks like uh, a snakes at the uh, top of the head here these like similar to the veins dilated varicose veins on the anterior abdominal wall like it's like snakes at the anterior abdominal these superficial veins that drain the blood from anterior abdominal wall so they look like the greek uh, myth about the cabot medusa like uh, i think a woman that has snakes all and carrying like snakes at the top of um, uh, her head so anyway why this uh, uh why we uh, we or why the let us say patients gets like uh, these kind of varicose vein the anterior abdominal wall indeed indeed you know this is the anterior abdominal wall and the blood from the anterior abdominal wall it usually um uh, uh, uh returned to the uh caval uh, 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 vessels that means the blood return to the systemic uh, circulation and you have here like up and down you have for example lateral thoracic veins and you have also inferiorly superficial epigastric veins and you have lumbar veins so mainly these veins drain into the uh, uh, vena cava right uh, either superior or inferior but uh, indeed also you this is the umbilicus and there is part from anterior abdominal wall here and the diaphragm the blood from there drained into small veins that accompany the obliterated umbilical vein these small veins called 
para-umbilical veins that drain to the ultimately to the portal circulation in the liver but in case if there is obstruction if there is obstruction in the uh, portal vein that I talked about here this is the portal vein if there is obstruction here or if there is a liver cirrhosis or any kind of disease in the liver that prevents the blood from returning back to the liver and uh, leads at the end uh, to uh, portal hypertension increase the pressure here that means the blood try to find another way to get into the um, systemic circulation and in this way you have the paraumbilical vein that uh, let me erase here that means you have the para umbilical veins that connects the um, the anterior abdominal wall and uh, the veins in the anterior abdominal walls kind of into the um, uh, portal circulation so then the blood will be returned from the portal circulation through umbilical vein back into these small superficial veins right up and down and laterally the result will be dilated veins right dilated veins something called cupboard mediosa that's in that means it indicates uh, in case of uh, there's a liver disease there's a portal hypertension there's a obstruction in the portal circulation so this is the cabot mediosa so let, us, uh, let me show you this is the umbilicus and you know the superficial uh, um, uh, bigastric veins here and of course lateral uh, thoracic vein here, lumbar veins here. So anyway, connected with the paraumbilical vein, you see here that drains into portal circulation. That means it has a connection here, anastomosis. In case of there is obstruction here or liver disease, then the blood will move back. The fra will be uh, like moved through the umbilic paraumbilical veins outside on the anterior abdominal wall. Then these veins will be dilated, right? will be dilated it creates a kind of the cupboard medusa you see um, here so um, the uh, also as we talk about the large intestine a small intestine we have to mention the uh, colostomy so colostomy is a kind of a procedure that maintain an exit uh, to the um, stool outside the um, for example is the large intestine so we call this is a stoma or colostomy which is an opening uh, if there is like for example a surgery in the distal part in the sigmoid say or in the rectum or there is obstruction a tumor obstructed the pathway the path the, the uh, pathway here that means uh, 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 there is a need to open the directly part of large intestine to outside through the anterior abdominal wall by creating an opening here uh, of course closed by a peg to empty the content of large intestine there and change every so often this is a procedure called colostomy if it's in the large intestine or if you open the small intestine to the outside of abdominal wall we call it ileostomy this is a stoma, the opening is a stoma, right? So, again, you heard maybe, maybe about the upper endoscopy in the stomach and also you have lower endoscopy. Look at the, here is the rectum and there is, um, you see here, um, a kind of uh, uh, endoscope uh, that inserted in the rectum sigmoid ascending cone, this uh, descending cone, transverse cone, all the way until you reach the cecum. It is like with um, uh, a camera, and uh, you get like um, uh, a view from the interior, um, from the interior of the cone, and you observed and photographed it. A procedure, as I mentioned, called colonoscopy or coloscopy. Uh, or lower endoscopy, right? All of these, like, uh, uh, was uh, indicate to the this procedure. So this is the colonoscopy. That means you look inside the colon to see uh, if there is bleeding, if there is any abnormality there, if there is uh, friction, if there is uh, 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 any kind of. Uh, uh, 
tumor there or sometime it's just uh, a regular uh, procedure uh, done every so often okay that was about the anatomy of the uh, uh, large uh, intestine thank you for listening and uh, I hope you find value in it thank you